Good morning. My name is Luann Greenwald. I'm the director of the Hilliard Art Museum and very pleased to welcome you all this morning. Some of you were with us last night for our night to honor Paul Hilliard. Thank you for joining us for that. If you weren't able to join us, I encourage you to come by the museum to see a wonderful exhibition, The Art of Sir Winston Churchill. It'll be on view at the museum through March 21st. And please note that the program that you have today uh, serves as, as free admission to see the exhibition. In a moment, you'll hear from the curator of that exhibition, Tim Riley, from the National Churchill Museum. But first, I want to say thanks to a couple of people who made this project possible. Uh, maybe they would be so kind to stand. Uh, Catherine Skurlock, who's our in incoming chair of the Hilliard Society Board. I know she's here somewhere. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> um, Lee Pollock, who's with the International Churchill Society, maybe not here yet, and uh, Greg Collins, who's uh, with the New Orleans Churchill Society. Um, these three people came together and, and made this all happen, so we're very grateful. We've been honored to work on this project with our partners at the National World War II Museum, and I want to say a very special thanks to uh, the director, Stephen Watson, and his assistant, Meg Cahill, and also to Jeremy Collins and Rob Satino from the Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. And finally, thank you to the Light Center for allowing us to use this beautiful venue, and to Acadiana Open Channel, who is filming this uh, today, and it will be live streamed on the internet. Today's symposium, Churchill in Conflict and Culture, is supported by the generous sponsorship of Oates and Marino, and I know Larry Oates and, uh, excuse me, Larry Marino and Ann Moorhead Marino are with us today, so please join me in a round of applause for them. I'm honored to introduce two special guests who will make remarks before we begin. Uh, Dr. Tim Riley, the Sandra L. and Monroe Trout Director and Chief Curator at the National Churchill Museum in Fulton, Missouri, was appointed Director Emeritus in 2012 after serving as Director of the Trout Museum of Art and as a Curatorial and Education Assistant at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He's authored several essays and curated exhibitions on the work of Sir Winston Churchill, including the current exhibition at the Hilliard Museum. Tim's remarks will be followed by Stephen Watson, who is the president and chief executive officer of the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. He served the museum in several roles since 2002, first as director of membership, launching a national campaign that grew its membership to 60,000. Later, he served in roles as, assist as Associate Vice President of Development, Chief Operating Officer, and Executive Vice President. The National World War II Museum offers its patrons new ways to connect with history and honor the generation that sacrificed so much to secure our freedom. The museum has grown to be one of the nation's most comprehensive repositories for the history and education relating to World War II. Please join me in welcoming Tim Riley and then Stephen Watson. Well, thank you, Luann, and good morning. Um, exhibitions of Winston Churchill's paintings uh, don't happen every day, and they don't happen with a, a lot of help. Luann mentioned uh, several people who were instrumental in, in making this happen. But before the individuals get involved, uh, it's important for us to realize that, like Winston Churchill himself, uh, it takes a, a certain amount of audacity um, to do something like this. Uh, Winston Churchill is well known as a statesman, a leader, uh, a military commander, a soldier. Um, he's not always known as an artist. If you read biographies about Winston Churchill, they may mention his painting, often in footnotes. Uh, but an exhibition like this one allows us to take a deep dive into this lesser known part of a well-known man. Uh, Winston Churchill had a passion for painting. And one of the things you'll take away, I hope today, from the remarks from our distinguished speakers, but also by visiting 
the exhibition and looking in the gallery uh, is that Winston Churchill himself uh, sharpened his skills of observation, his legendary, uh, visionary outlook uh, on strategic planning, uh, on alliance building, uh, on all the leadership qualities we, we associate with Winston Churchill and try to emulate today, um, were informed and inspired by his painting. When he looked at the world to paint a tree, a seascape, or a landscape, uh, it was the same mind that looked at uh, the world from a strategic standpoint. Uh, how do people get along? How do countries get along? How do nations get along? How do yellows get along with blues or greens? Or as Churchill said, the poor browns. And I think when we look and organize exhibitions uh, like the one uh, at Hilliard, uh, you begin to appreciate even more uh, the quality and depth uh, of Churchill's range. And I, I leave you with, with, with that thought. When you, when you look at the exhibition, uh, when you encounter the paintings, uh, remember this. Remember that Churchill himself uh, said in his famous essay, Painting is a Pastime, written in 1921, uh, that painting came to his rescue. Uh, at times uh, when Churchill was down and defeated, uh, his famous resilience, his grit, his determination came to the fore. And he used painting to shift gears, to slow down, and to observe the world around him. Uh, and in his case, leave us uh, with some remarkably beautiful images. Um, that large picture takeaway is a very Churchillian thought, uh, and one that I, I leave with you. Um, I applaud uh, everyone here in this room for coming and supporting uh, Winston Churchill on so many levels. To do a symposium like this one, uh, I think will we'll further enhance our understanding uh, of the great man. And congratulations to uh, my colleagues, uh, my new friends at the Hilliard Museum for doing such a terrific, terrific job. Uh, and for you, Paul Hilliard, uh, for the vision. When asked uh, which artist should we show in the Hilliard Museum, he immediately said, Churchill. Um, that takes vision and audacity, too. Uh, so once again, on behalf of America's National Churchill Museum, enjoy this symposium. Please, please enjoy uh, the exhibition. These don't happen very often. Uh, so when you get a chance to see one, uh, do so. Once again, thank you. Turn it over to Stephen. Well, good morning. It's wonderful to see a room full of people interested in history. And uh, welcome to our symposium on Churchill uh, in Conflict and Culture. And I'll start by telling my boss, uh, Chairman of the Board, uh, Paul Hilliard, my comments will be shorter than last night, I, I promise. Um, but um, we do have a tradition at the museum, and that is we love to start all of our public programs by acknowledging our World War II veterans, home front workers, and Holocaust survivors. And I know we have at least one World War II veteran with us here today, so Paul, please stand and be recognized. And any other World War II veterans, home front workers, or Holocaust survivors, please wave to be recognized too. I'd also like to ask other veterans that have served in other uh, conflicts or peacetime, or those of you that are currently serving actively in the military, please stand and be recognized for your service to our country also. Thank you. We uh, have a number of our current and former uh, members of the museum's board of trustees here with us today. Some of you are local, but some of you have traveled from far away, Detroit, Riverside, California. I'd like to ask all of our museum trustees, current and former, to please stand and be recognized for their leadership in helping create the great National World War II Museum. Thank you. This is like a workout for Paul. We have to make him stand up at least three or four times during these remarks. So. Um, it's really quite special for us to have partnered with the Hilliard Art Museum uh, on this great uh, program. Um, of course, afar, apart from us uh, sharing uh, their namesake, 
uh, Mr. Paul Hilliard, who is our chairman, it's really a great example of what can be accomplished with partnerships. Um, our new institute for the study of war and democracy has made a, a point of forming partnerships to more effectively tell the complete story of World War II. It's really a part of what has made our past program so successful and something that will remain a priority as our institute continues to expand new programs into the future. So today, for instance, through this partnership, we really get to approach Churchill from two very different perspectives. One, through the artistic perspective, through the Hilliard Art Museum, and of course, through a historical perspective, through the work of the World War II Museum. And uh, interestingly enough, um, we have long hosted a lecture every year on Churchill, and I think it shows that he has always had a way of bringing people together for the greater good. Uh, in fact, in just a few weeks, uh, February 8th, uh, we will host, uh, our institute will host another very special symposium on the 75th anniversary of the Yalta Conference, and I'm sure many of you in this room know that was the last monumental meeting of the big three, Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin. And I would invite you to come to the museum for that very special symposium on February 8th, or at any time for a visit to the National World War II Museum. But in the meantime, it is time to get this program started, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to your MC for the day, Jeremy Collins, who is the Director of Conferences and Symposia at the Museum's Institute. Jeremy will tell you a little bit more about the program and our speakers, and we will get right into it. Well, thank you to everyone. Uh, you'll note in your program that uh, Ed Lingle, Dr. Lingle, was supposed to serve as MC. He uh, has a very pressing assignment that's due at 5 p.m. today, so I'm glad I'm here and he's where he is. Um, it's my job to uh, keep the show running and to keep us on time, so we'll be expeditious in our introductions. Uh, that's not an insult to any or all of our speakers. It's meant so that you hear from them and not from me. As Stephen mentioned, we're going to look at Winston today in two regards, in conflict and culture. And the first session will feature doc Dr. Richard Frankel, associate professor here at University of Louisiana in this great city of Lafayette. He's also the director of graduate studies, and he will be our first speaker looking at one of Churchill's longest running adversaries, Germany. Uh, he will be looking at the cult of leadership and the cult of Bismarck because that was so influential in what Winston and who Winston actually fought against in the 21st, uh, 20th century. Then we'll hear from Rob Satino, our Executive Director of the Institute for the Study of War and Democracy, and the museum's senior historian in New Orleans. I was thinking that it's pretty interesting. We have two of our own, two of the University of Louisiana's, and then we also have two Brits that are on the program, too. So we're New Orleans, Lafayette, and Great Britain. And it's going to be a great, action-packed, history-packed day. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, Dr. Richard Frankel. Hey, thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Hilliard and everyone at the Hilliard Museum and uh, the World War II Museum, of course, and, and UL, uh, and all of you for coming. This is a, a tremendous uh, audience um, for us here today. Uh, and as you um, already got the sense, I will not be talking about Winston Churchill uh, today. Uh, I don't study Winston Churchill. I don't write about Winston Churchill. Uh, but it's interesting, so when, when I was approached to, to be a part of this, I wondered what I would be talking about. Um, and it made me think about um, what the relationship is between Germany and, uh, and Britain. In fact, uh, as an undergraduate back in the previous century, I was uh, very much interested in British history and uh, British-German relations. Uh, and there's a great deal of, of, of that relationship in terms of perception and misperception, uh, the image of Britain in the sort of the mind of, of Germany um, has played an important role, um, uh, a lot of, uh, I should say, misperception. Uh, Britain represented, uh, among other things, 
a liberal alternative uh, to the traditional sort of Prussian conservative uh, politics of Germany. Uh, Wilhelm II uh, had a kind of love-hate relationship with Britain, loved to wear British naval uniforms and loved the Navy and had a kind of complex relationship with his grandmother, Victoria. Um, of course, in the two world wars, Britain was the enemy. Uh, it served as a kind of anti-Semitic trope uh, for Germany's right-wing nationalists. Uh, they used to refer to it as the nation of shopkeepers. Um, and even for Hitler in terms of British imperialism, uh, which served as a kind of model, uh, he would uh, refer to his vision of Eastern Europe uh, as being modeled on British India. Uh, and so thinking back, as I said, there's a lot to, to connect there between Germany and Britain. Uh, but I do uh, work on said perception, misperception, actually, it's what I've been doing most of my career. Um, and that work on the cult of leadership, the cult of Bismarck, um, I realized is very significant for understanding uh, the, the opposite, uh, of the, the uh, opponent for Churchill for much of the first half of the 20th century um, in the way in which the Bismarck cult sort of um, shaped German politics that drove it in an increasingly radical, um, violent, and irrational direction. And so I want to talk about what that Bismarck cult was, how it came about, and show some, some features of it. And we can take a look at, at some imagery, for example, and some artwork. Um, that was a big part of the cult uh, as well. So in early July uh, 1944, uh, Ulrich von Hassel, uh, who was a member of the conspiracy that would soon thereafter try to assassinate Hitler, uh, was walking through the Bismarck estate, and uh, this was the one that's outside of Friedrichsruhe. Of course, he had more than one. Um, inside the house, he noticed the painting of Bismarck, which depicted him, as he put it, powerful and violent. This painting, as a matter of fact. Um, Next to these two sunken figures of French, the French politicians, Adolf Thiers and Jules Favre. And he considered this, what he said, a, to be a correct example of the foolish interpretation which we ourselves have spread. Van Hassel recommended that the painting be thrown away. And while Van Hassel was largely correct in his interpretation of the image that too many Germans had created of Bismarck, we should be glad that they didn't throw this away, or many of the uh, countless other images of Bismarck that were created over those uh, previous 75 years. Um, they provide valuable insight into the development of a political culture that over time came to increasingly be marked by a significant stream of irrational thinking, which also helped radicalize much of the German middle class and ultimately facilitated the rise and success of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party. And it's the role of imagery and symbolism in the development of political culture that I want to speak to, to you about today, specifically the image of Bismarck and the cult that grew up around him, and the impact of that cult of leadership that helped make Germany such a dangerous foe for Churchill, Britain, and the rest of the world. And so. We have a Bismarck cult that emerged. Um, why Bismarck, right, of all people? Uh, Bismarck, uh, many of you may know, was the sort of founding father of modern Germany. He was the person who played the key role in the unification of Germany in the late 1860s and early 1870s. Um, and so as such, he was a natural candidate for such a, such a role. But it was also not just that he unified Germany, but the way that he did it, uh, he did it through three successful wars, the last two which were against great powers and, and really unexpected victories, uh, and in doing so fulfilled the decades-long dream of German nationalists to bring about the creation of a new German nation state, and in doing so also established Germany as a major power 
the major power on the continent of Europe and maintain the security and that great power position for the next 20 years. And so it's both the combination of what he did and the way that he did it, um, and also in doing it a certain way, uh, gave certain values to this image of Bismarck and to German political culture that would be important later on after he's gone. Um, it's not just, again, the wars that he fought, but what he did in solving at the time what was um, a seemingly insoluble uh, domestic political crisis, and he did that through not diplomacy and negotiations with the parliament, but through violence. He fought three wars, which ended that domestic logjam. And so the idea that seemingly insoluble uh, uh, problems can be solved by violence, that violence can be a good thing um, in solving your problems, uh, and that they can be solved also, and they should be solved, and perhaps only be solved, um, by the sheer force of genius and will. Right, that it took someone like Bismarck uh, and his superhuman abilities to, to bring about this great end. And also in his style of politics, which was to bring some people together, to bring some Germans together through the demonization of others, uh, what we might call um, inclusion through exclusion, by um, having some people believe they're more German by pointing out certain groups that were less German or un-German, or in fact, as he liked to label those groups he didn't like, enemies of the nation, socialists, Catholics, um, whichever year you happen to be looking at in his case. And those, as I said, would color that cult, and those who subscribed to that cult and who followed, that, those became values that were integral to their view of politics. Um, he was, in many respects, a legend while he was still alive. Okay. Um, as I said, he remained in office after unification for almost 20 years. And in doing so, he provided legitimacy to this new government. After all, Germany is brand new at this point, And you could argue there's a little bit of a legitimacy uh, concern on their part. And so he provides that stability, that strength. Um, and so celebrating Bismarck became a way of celebrating the government. And supporting Bismarck became a way of supporting the government, of supporting Germany. Uh, his birthdays were celebrated. Uh, towns and cities across Germany renamed streets and squares after him. Uh, he was granted honorary citizenship in towns and cities across the country. Um, early monuments were erected. Oops, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Uh, monuments were erected to him uh, as well while he was still alive. Um, and these uh, events, these celebrations, provided an opportunity for pilgrimages to be made. And this is the term that they did use, pilgrimage. Um, the Bismarck estate in Friedrichsruhe, which was right outside of Hamburg, uh, and his other one uh, in Varzin, which is today actually in Poland, thanks to um, Hitler's policies. These became destinations for those seeking uh, inspiration and legitimation for their politics. Um, the 80th birthday, Bismarck's 80th birthday in 1895, the last major birthday before his passing, uh, was a high point with, with massive pilgrimages and, and commemorations. Um, paintings served to buttress his uh, legend, obviously this one. Um, Others as well. Uh, this is a rather famous painting of the um, culmination of the Wars of Unification um, by Anton von Werner. This is in the um, Palace, in the, uh, the Hall of Mirrors in the Palace of Versailles, the proclamation of a unified Germany, of the German Empire. Uh, and in fact, this painting went, uh, underwent many different versions um, over the years. This is not the first one. Uh, but it is noteworthy in that in each new version of the painting, Bismarck moves more and more to the center of the painting. Uh, and in fact, he did not wear a white military uniform during the actual ceremony. He would not have worn that. But of course, it brings you directly to him, right, in the painting. Um, and so, you know, the man who should be honored uh, to the left there, the, the emperor, um, kind of gets second billing to, to Bismarck in the middle there. 
Um, out of office, this continued. Um, oops. Okay. So, for example, here we see again a kind of uh, development. This is the very old Bismarck. He's only two years left uh, on this earth, and you know he looks frail. He looks like he's, you know, on his way. Um, and this is the, the photograph with the painting. Um, gives those eyes, you know, more of a sort of prophetic, you know, looking beyond the seer and so forth, rather than the, the frail um, impression that they give uh, over there. Uh, so, as I said, out of office, he does continue to play a role. And in fact, it's, it's his dismissal in 1890 that plays a key role in transforming the image of Bismarck and the function of the Bismarck cult, um, not just because he was out of office really, but also in fact the way that he was um, uh, treated out of office by Wilhelm II, the, the emperor. Um, and Wilhelm II um, loved Wilhelm II. Uh, he was a uh, tremendous uh, narcissist. Bismarck was too. Let's, you know, let's give them both credit, but there can only be one emperor. Uh, and without Bismarck in office, uh, Wilhelm II wanted to play down Bismarck's accomplishments in favor of his own families. And he wanted to create a cult of, of Hohenzollern, of his dynasty. Uh, and he diminished Bismarck when he did mention him, and he tried not to. Um, and Bismarck, who liked the attention, uh, was now at home, at his estate, old and being ignored. And he was angry and seething. And he decided to act out and serve as a kind of pole of opposition for this new regime under this new young emperor uh, who was not giving him his, his due. And so this coincided with a time when middle class Germans nationalist Germans were frustrated with just what the government was doing. They felt the government was not being nationalist enough. Believe me, it was being nationalist enough. Uh, but they were not satisfied with that. They wanted more and more. And Bismarck, in a sense, offered himself up to them as a symbol to hammer the government with and to say that you're not German enough. You're not doing what Bismarck would have done. Okay. And he went along with that. And it could only go so far, of course, because he was still alive. And if they did go beyond what he might have wanted to do, he could always slap them down by disagreeing with them. It's really the death of Bismarck that, that transforms him, that makes all of that no longer an issue. And Bismarck can, in many respects, become anything that they want him to be. Okay. He had a long enough career, he said all kinds of things that contradicted himself uh, all kinds of ways over the years. Uh, so death separated um, him, the man from the movement, um, and allowed the cult to emerge fully. And we see this, for example, at the time of his death. And within days of his death, um, there were two ceremonies, uh, two uh, ceremonies to mark his death in Berlin one of which was the official ceremony put forward by uh, Wilhelm II and the government. The other was by Berlin's Bismarckians, these middle-class Germans. Uh, the one thing they had in common was that Bismarck was not at either of them. The body was back in, in, in Friedrichsruhe, outside of Hamburg. Uh, that was his way of, again, sticking it to Wilhelm II, that he was not going to be able to speak over his body. Um, but also, the nature of the ceremonies, the, 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 the official one was very traditional, it was very staid, it was very quiet. Um, the Bismarckian one was much more emotional. It had music, it had speeches, it was much more inspiring. And it's, it's that emotion um, that, and that again, kind of increasingly irrational approach is what's going to mark the cult. Um, monuments to Bismarck. Again, played an important role. Um, monuments were not new to the period after his death. As I said, while he was in office, there were monuments built for Bismarck, uh, but they were very traditional. You know, 
Bismarck, right, in various poses, but straightforward Bismarck. This is 1877 in, in Cologne. But with his death, uh, you have an important transformation that takes place, um, and that is that monuments to Bismarck are no longer in any way attached to, again, the person. They become completely abstracted. Uh, and this is partly an inspiration from this right-wing, particularly university student movement at the time, one of the most radical nationalist groups in Germany at the time. And they developed this, this model of this fire tower, these various versions. This is actually a little bit more sophisticated. A lot of them had this just rough-hewn rock. Um, they all had these fire pans at the top. Uh, in fact, there was a company that sold them, so you could order them in newspapers and so forth. Uh, and literally, there were hundreds of these built across Germany. Um, and they would be lit on the time of his birthday, at the time of his death, and on the summer solstice. So along with these kinds of Germanic, runic kind of um, images, even a new holiday connecting Bismarck to this almost pre-Christian kind of celebration of the summer solstice, um, and as I said, really separating him and getting to the essence or the spirit of Bismarck. One magazine described these fire towers as, quote, altars of sacrifice for the German spirit, dedicated not only to his memory, but rather a visible sign that his spirit lives further among us so long as there exist German men. The myth there's other ways of doing this, of abstracting Bismarck, of mythologizing him, of heroizing him. Uh, so for example, and still at least you can see him, but in this case as the medieval um, uh, knight Roland. Uh, this is uh, in Hamburg, it's, it's still there today. It's, it's got a little bit of graffiti on it now. It's, it looks over the, well, never know this. Um, this kind of mythologizing of Bismarck, again, taking him out of time. Um, and the monuments, the mausoleum, these also, again, served as locations, as holy sites um, for the rituals that developed around this new god, according to this calendar of birthday, anniversary of his death, the summer solstice. Um, and on one or more of these dates, Bismarckians would make the pilgrimage. They would pay homage. Um, and take something away. Uh, according to a Dresden newspaper in 1903, quote, German patriots feel new holy life rising up inside of them when, as at the grave in Friedrichsruh, they hold holy dialogue with the spirit of their hero. Through the still loneliness of the forest, it rustles like a revelation. And on the consecrated site, the devout national pilgrim receives a wealth of the richest impressions which impart to him goal and direction for his whole life. There lies a mysterious, endlessly life-giving power in such a national pilgrimage in spirit to the resting place of the greatest of all Germans. Okay. Though it was by no means a fully uh, unified movement, there did emerge a kind of general storyline, a historical understanding, a gospel, if you will, uh, that served to give meaning and purpose to this emerging cult. At the monuments at the grave and halls across the country, Bismarckians, mainly academics, historians, I'm not proud to say, were among the high priests of the Bismarck cult, spoke of a time when Germans wandered through the desert of statelessness until a savior appeared and led them through the wilderness to the promised land of a united Germany. Those very same Germans, though, over time, grew comfortable and complacent. And eventually, a new king arrived who dismissed the old savior, and the people did nothing. Germany was now suffering the consequences. It had no leadership. One day, though, Bismarck would arise. There would come a new leader to make Germany great again. Until then, they would have to keep the spirit of Bismarck alive and in their hearts. And this message only grew more powerful and was seen as more fundamentally true with the crises that Germany would experience beginning in 1914 
with world war, with defeat, revolution, two major economic crises, and a man would arrive who seemed to develop you know, his movement out of his, his own genius and will, uh, and who told Germans everything they wanted to hear and promised to make Germany great again, um, and deliberately placed himself in that, uh, under that cloak of Bismarck. Okay? By this point in time, there changed times, the distance, it was more believable. In the 1890s, someone like Hitler could never get away with claiming to be another Bismarck, but by this point he could. And he did this until 1938, when with the Anschluss, the joining of Austria to Germany, the one thing that Bismarck didn't do as the unifier of Germany, Hitler, the new Bismarck, did. And here you have a, a fantastic bit of symbolism here. Uh, Bismarck Roland, again, the medieval knight, uh, casting his vote in the plebiscite, approving of the Anschluss, right? to the creator of Greater Germany. Okay? Bismarck created Little Germany. Hitler creates Greater Germany, and with that, Hitler can shed Bismarck. He no longer needs him because he has his own, his own suit of armor as well. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I taught university for 34 years, 33 years, before I came to the museum a few years ago. And this is very typical of an 8.30 lecture hall. The students are always in place. There's, there's overflow. People are searching. Actually, it's, it's about 400% more of you than there normally are. Um, but uh, I want to just echo what everyone else has said. Thanks so much to everyone for joining us. Uh, we, we live in the present and we're heading into the future and, and sometimes it's good to sit down and, and think about the past. But not to do so individually, we can all read books, but to do so collectively and kick ideas around and, and comparisons and contrasts. And I just think this is a, a, a wonderful thing. We often say, you know, history's not doing so well uh, nowadays. No one cares. A lot of people care about history. And at the National World War II Museum, we know that. And we see that exhibited every day and I'm seeing it again. So Thanks a lot. Um, I thought today that I, I would talk about Winston Churchill's military career. And now when I say that, I know all sorts of things pop into your head. Uh, but that would be the Battle of Britain in 1940 and their finest hour and, and all the decisions that had to be made in the course of World War II. But I'm going to go a little bit further back into the Churchill biography and a little bit back into the Churchill story to look at a younger Churchill. Uh, perhaps a Churchill that we're not as familiar with as the, the, the more classic, heroic period of his life, which of course is 1940 to 1945. I call the talk the, the father of the man, young Churchill at war. Um, many of you will understand the reference in his 1802 poem, the great poet William Wordsworth, the poem is My Heart Leaps Up, wrote the immortal line, the child is father of the man. Now, what he meant by that, of course, is that <clears throat> what we do in our lives and what we become in our lives is very often determined by experiences deep in our past, deep in our childhood. Uh, that's the poetic version. Uh, through Freud, then, it becomes kind of this, uh, this commonplace idea that things that happen to you in your early years are formative for where you're going in your life. And I think there's no better illustration of this truth than the life of Winston Churchill. From an early age, Churchill's persona was tightly bound up with war. Born in 1874, uh, into the, what we might say the British Empire at its height. I guess you can put 10 people together and have an argument about exactly what year that would be. But 1874 would be a good one. Uh, he, like many young Victorian boys of his social class, dreamt of, of battlefield glory and acts of valor. Toy soldiers, uh, little lead figurines in, in this case. They were little plastic figurines in my case. Uh, flags, castles, great cavalry charges. These were the, the stuff of Winston's young imagination. Uh, he dreamt big, and it's always curious to me how many men and women of achievement in life begin very early on by, by, by just thinking 
big. He dreamt big. As a schoolboy at Harrow in 1891, Winston Churchill once remarked to a classmate, I have a wonderful idea of where I shall be eventually. London will be in danger, and in the high position I shall occupy, it will fall to me to save the capital and save the empire. I feel like I could just do a mic drop right now and walk away, um, because that's sort of proven the whole point that the, the child uh, being, the, being the father to the man, but b bear with me, I'll, let's talk our way through it a little bit further. I mean, at that age, I was saying I'm going home and I'm watching Brady Bunch. I'm trying to think what I was saying about myself at that age, and maybe you might want to consider what you, the sorts of things you were saying about yourselves at that, at that age as well. Well, knowing that the path to this great position, which he envisioned for himself, um, led through a military career, uh, he applied to Sandhurst in 1893. We often say the, the British West Point, but in fact, West Point is the, British, is the American. Sandhurst, I think, is probably more accurate. He was commissioned into the fourth Queen's own Hussars, and there's perhaps the most famous portrait of, of young Winston Churchill. You see this in the you get a good look at, the, at his, his face. You can see something of his character and, of course, the extremely ornate uniform of a cavalry regiment of the, of the day. He would spend the next five years of his life in the regiment, so a little less than five, December of 1894 to spring of 1899. But what a five-year period this was, not only in his own story, but in the, in, in the, the global story of the British Empire and in world history in general. Winston wished to be where the fighting was, we might say where the action was. And he exploited every family connection he could think of to get himself posted to a battlefront. Uh, his mother played a key role, as, as he admitted, in, in social contacts. In my interest, as Winston once put it, she left no wire unpulled, no stone unturned, no cutlet uncooked. <laughs> Which is a Beautiful piece of Churchillian rhetoric. It's always the third item in the triad that really nails it. No cutlet uncooked. Well, it's a relatively brief period then of, of Winston Churchill's actual military service. But during this brief period, he took part in a series of campaigns that we can often overlook because we are so fixated on his finest hour in 1940. It's the part of the story we want to get to, of course. But let's look at some of these campaigns that Winston Churchill uh, either witnessed or took part in. In November of 1895, Churchill traveled to Cuba. Here, the Cuban people had risen up in revolt against their Spanish rulers. Cuba, of course, was a longtime Spanish colony. The colony had been ruled by Spain, or better yet, misruled by Spain. Spain itself is having all sorts of internal political problems. And there's a rebellion against Spanish rule in Cuba. He went to Cuba to serve as an observer with the Spanish army. Now, he was quite frank about why he was there. He wanted a small war where he could prove himself on the battlefield, where he could prove his mettle. A private rehearsal, he called it. So if, if things didn't go that well, it's hardly the epicenter of global affairs, right? The, the Cuban revolt against the Spanish. So no matter what happened, it, it, it wouldn't, he wouldn't be in the big glare of publicity. But he could prove uh, his military worth, perhaps not only to those around him, but perhaps even more so to, uh, to himself. In Cuba, Winston saw combat for the first time and received the Order of Military Merit from the Spanish for distinguished comportment under Fire. He was 21, and he had had his first experience now of, of enemy fire. Small skirmishes, essentially. Now, the next year, in 1896, the 4th Queen's Own, his regiment, were sent to India, to the southern city of Bangalore. And Winston threw himself into the peacetime uh, garrison habits, typical peacetime garrison habits, uh, playing polo, in which he excelled, uh, drinking perhaps more than is good for you, uh, another item at which he excelled, and garrison troops often excel, but also in Winston Churchill's case, and again, it's what sets him apart, reading. Churchill had come to the idea, uh, the, come to the belief that he simply lacked the education, lacked the breadth of knowledge of global affairs to become that great figure who would someday rescue the British Empire. 
Well, he soon wearied of inaction, and that's something else we can take to the bank about Winston Churchill rarely going to sit in the same place for long. He wearied of inaction, and in 1897, got himself posted to a battlefront. In this case, <clears throat> the Malakand Field Force on the northwest frontier of India, operating in the Swat Valley near the border with Afghanistan, something that many American military personnel today would understand completely. He took part in the siege of Malakand. Now, Malakand was a British outpost uh, that had been beset by fierce Pashtun tribesmen on the frontier. Uh, the fort was surrounded for weeks and had to be rescued by a relief expedition, harrowing uh, 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 adventures on all sides. A typical uh, a look at a sort of a typical battle in the Malakand fight. There's a British fort that's under attack by Pashtun fighters. You see the British artillery and guns are, are uh, firing off the, off the battlements and, and off the walls. Well, Churchill took part in the fight. He received mention in dispatches, you know, you sort of mention in the official reports, for rescuing a wounded man under fire. Once again, he'd been very frank about his motives for taking part. I was listening to Richard talk about myth-making. Churchill was complicit in his own myth-making. He wanted to make a myth of himself. It was part of his strategy. It's part of the reason he went into the army. And part of, you can go into the army, and, and if you are clever, you can avoid frontline duty. That was not Churchill. He wanted frontline duty in part to make, make a, a, a mythological figure of himself. He wanted a, a reputation building, I guess we might say, with an eye to a future career in politics. Now, he also wrote a brilliant account of the fighting. The story of the Malakand Field Force, an episode of frontier war, he called it, in which he included some a pungent stra a, a criticisms excuse me, of British strategy, a criticisms which should sound very familiar to US readers after 18 years of our own war in Afghanistan. And let me just read a, a, a brief portion from the Malakand Field Force. So far then, Churchill writes, we have advanced and have been resisted. The forward policy we are following has brought an increase of territory a nearer approach to what is presumably a better frontier line. It has also brought war. So the British have India, but they're nervous about India. So you then have to conquer the, 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 the bordering territories, the frontier territories, in this case, Afghanistan. And once you've secured Afghanistan, there's something else that could threaten Afghanistan. It's a forward policy, always moving forward. So it's brought us a better frontier line. It has also brought us war. All of this has, uh, has to have been expected. It may be said of the present system that it precludes the possibility of peace. Isolated posts have been formed in the midst of races notoriously passionate, reckless, and warlike. They are seen as challenges. When they are assailed by the tribesmen, relief and punitive expeditions become necessary, and so it goes. He saw a kind of permanent or endless war on the border territories, the northwest frontier of India uh, in Afghanistan. It's a brilliantly written book, uh, and, and very well received, I might add, which is also another uh, sign of things to come. So, Spain, uh, Afghanistan, actually the Swat Valley, I even love the title. Um, the next year, it was Africa proper. Here, Winston Churchill would take part in his first great battle. A British force under Lord Kitchener launched a campaign from British-occupied Egypt to the south to retake the region known as the Sudan, today the independent nation of Sudan. The enemy here were the dervishes, Islamic tribesmen who had destroyed a British army under General Charles Gordon in the 1880s and had established an independent kingdom. Once again, a forward strategy. You hold, uh, you hold Egypt. And Egypt is dependent for its very life on the Nile. And so what must you do? You must control the Nile. The Nile flows from south to north. You must hold the Sudan, or else enemy tribes into your south can cut off the water supply to Egypt, theoretically. So now we're in Sudan. Kitchener advanced carefully and cautiously to the south, coming down the Nile, and established a, a series of fortified positions along the river itself. At Omdurman, the British force was attacked 
by a massive army of some 50,000 dervish cavalrymen. Um, you can see here, uh, there's the, the Nile back here. And the British have formed a kind of fortified position along the Nile. Uh, bramble bushes and trenches kind of settle, setting in as their front. Uh, by the way, by now, British forces in Africa were wearing khaki. So the, the redcoats is a, is a misconstrual of exactly the way that the Battle of Omdurman looked. But, but there it is. Well, you know, what, what you see in the paper is often a fan, uh, at the time is often a kind of fanciful version of the way the battle actually took place. But a massive force of 50,000 dervishes charging. Now, this battle was a harbinger of things to come. I know that's a tiresome phrase. Historians are always finding things that are a harbinger of things to come. But um, the Battle of Omdurman is definitely one. Uh, things to come in the 20th century. We're still in 1898. Dervish horsemen charged the British lines over and over again, only to be shot to pieces, massacred by British artillery and early versions of the, of the machine gun, the British Max, the famous Maxim gun. The slaughter was tremendous, and nowhere did the dervishes even get close to the British line. There's, there's some descriptions that a, a party of dervishes managed to work their way as, as close as 50 meters, but no one closer than, no one closer than that. Well, Churchill was here as well. He was, he was everywhere in this period. Churchill was at Omdurman as a war correspondent. And what he saw at Omdurman enthralled and I would also argue haunted him for the rest of his life. Riding out ahead in the morning to scout the, the lines, the, the morning of the battle, Churchill spied, came up over a ridge, it's very dramatic, he came up over a ridge, and then spied the entire dervish army lined up for action. 50,000 enemy horsemen brilliantly arrayed for battle, a line that stretched four miles long. So it's, it's horizon to horizon, as far as you can see from one corner of your vision to the next enemy forces ready to ride to the attack. It's magnificent. It's a magnificent sight. Anyone who's ever seen it will have seen the entire enemy army drawn up for battle. It's one of the, it's one of the lures of battle that keep human beings fighting wars, I, I would say. There's a certain magnificence to the vision. But those 50,000 dervish horsemen were no match for Western technology. In the course of one mad charge after the other, they suffered perhaps 10,000 dead in a single morning, with another 10,000 wounded and perhaps 5,000 uh, captured. Uh, the force was destroyed, in other words, before lunch. The entire dervish force was destroyed in about the period of time we're going to be spending together at this symposium. The British suffered 47 dead. The dervishes have a handful of antiquated artillery pieces, and they do a minor amount of damage, 47 to 10,000. Now this was human carnage on an epic scale. It was nothing like Churchill had seen at Malacan, nothing like what the small skirmishes he'd taken part in in, uh, in Cuba. And he was appalled. Late in the day, he walked the battlefield amid the heaps of dervish dead and dying. And out of that horrible experience, <coughs> excuse me, came some very beautiful prose published as part of his next book, an equally successful volume known as The River War, the river in this case, of course, being the Nile. And again, a brief passage from The River War. I have tried to gild war. And you put, put, put a bow on it and ribbon and try to make it look nice. I have tried to gild war with gold plating and to solace myself for the loss of dear and gallant friends with the thought that a soldier's death for a cause that he believes in will count for much wherever, uh, whatever may be beyond this world. Who knows? But it's got to count for something, a noble death. There was nothing dulce et decorum about the dervish dead. He's, he's an educated man now. He's largely an autodidact. Quoting the Roman poet Horace, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. It's a sweet and fitting thing to die for your country. There was nothing sweet and fitting, nothing, he wrote the Latin there, nothing dulce et decorum about the dervish dead, nothing of the dignity of unconquerable manhood. All was filthy corruption. He, noticed, he notes in the writing the, the, the way the human body twists and contorts when it's shot and then dies and under the, the, the desert sun. All was filthy corruption. Yet these were as brave men as ever walked the earth. He's talking about the enemy now. The conviction was borne in on me that their claim beyond the grave in respect of a valiant death 
was not less good than that which any of our countrymen could make. It was just as good as the British. They were just as brave as we were. It was technology which was the imbalance in this battle. You know, Churchill uh, at uh, Omdurman will also take part in a l brisk little action later in the day with the 21st Lancers, another cavalry regiment. Uh, some of the uh, dervishes are trying to uh, escape, retreat right away, and a British cavalry force rides out ahead and charges them. So he's actually part of a cavalry charge, the famous charge of the 21st Lancers. That's the passage in, Omdur in, in, in the River War on Omdurman that often gets quoted. But, but this is not, and I, I would argue that as we go forward in Churchill's life, it was that... The, the notion that some decision he made in World War II could lead to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of unnecessary deaths is something that haunted him. We talk about his experience in World War I, which is crucial, but I think maybe the formative uh, years were even a little bit earlier than that. Cuba, Afghanistan, the Sudan. Finally, Churchill took part in one last great war in this period, the war in South Africa against the Boers. Uh, descendants of the Dutch settlers of the region who, arrived, who had arrived at the Cape in the 1650s, a long time ago. In the late 19th century, diamonds are discovered in South Africa on the farm of an old Dutch Boer, a Dutch farmer by the name of De Beer. We have De Beer's diamond. Diamonds are forever. Um, Ten years later, huge deposits of gold discovered in South Africa. And suddenly South Africa has become sort of central to any sense of any notion of global strategy. So the British are fighting a war against these Dutch settlers in South Africa. The point is they want to over the British want to overtake and, uh, and conquer the entire uh, South African territory. Now <clears throat> the Boers were a formidable adversary. Boer in Dutch means farmer. <laughs> So you might say the British were fighting the Boer War. They're fighting a war against a bunch of farmers. But those farmers have lived in this country for centuries. They knew every nook and cranny of it. They were skilled horsemen, and they were extremely skilled with the rifle. They were crack shots. You have to be to survive on the South African veld. A Boer could hit a squirrel at 100 paces and maybe more than that. A Mauser rifle, as you see here, sighted out to 800 or 1,000 yards. Most of South Africa is a completely flat plain. You can hit a target at 800 yards. You're a formidable adversary uh, indeed. And there's a good look at, at some, of the, uh, some of the enemy the, the uh, uh, British were fighting in, in South Africa. If you look at them, there's something of the Wild West in the American context, something of the, of the desperado on the Wild West. Ammunition, bandoliers, slouch hats, floppy jackets, and the, and the whole bit. They're sort of dressed up in their Sunday best here, but it could, it could get even uh, uh, more variant than that. The early battles of the Boer War uh, saw the British Army shot to pieces, very similar to what had happened to the dervishes at Omdurman, although the scale of the battles were never quite that big. And that's an interesting uh, military problem all by itself. But Churchill's experience of the Boer War had little of that, little of big battle. Sent to South Africa, once again, as a correspondent, he was riding in a British armored train, the only way the British could control this vast tract of, of the South African territory. South Africa is roughly as big as France and Spain combined. The British have 30,000 men in that whole gigantic territory. So you patrol it through the use of trains, armored trains with guns and, and armor, uh, riding back and forth between the stations. And he's riding on an armored train. And the Boers ambush it. And you can probably predict what, uh, how this goes. Uh, there's a very narrow gorge. The train comes around a corner. There's a gigantic boulder on the tracks. And suddenly there's rifle fire coming down from all directions as the Boer marksmen in the, in the hills, in the mountains on either side. Winston grabbed the rifle and, and fought bravely, as everyone in that armored train did. Um, he, he even went out and under fire, helped dislodge the, the obstruction, the big boulder in front, so that some of the train could escape, one of the cars and several of the wounded men on the, on the train. So some escaped, but not Winston Churchill. He was taken prisoner. He wrote this up, too, because he wrote everything up that he did in his life and in the interest of his own career uh, and in the interest of history as well. From London, you know that town, to Ladysmith, which is in South Africa, via Pretoria, which is another city in South Africa. From London to Ladysmith via Pretoria. And here is the episode, once again, as he tells it. I jumped onto the line in order to collect the men as they arrived. 
and found myself alone in a shallow cutting and none of our soldiers. They had all surrendered. I couldn't see them anywhere. Then suddenly there appeared on the line at the end of the cutting two men not in uniform. Plate layers, I said to myself, railroad workers. And then with a surge of realization, Boers. My mind retains a momentary impression of these tall figures, full of animated movement, clad in dark flapping clothes with slouch storm-driven hats, poising on their rifles hardly a hundred yards away. I turned and ran between the rails of the track. <laughs> and the only thought I achieved was this. Here's the two words running through Winston Churchill's mind at this moment. Boer marksmanship. <laughs> He's a hundred yards away. Two of the finest marksmen on the planet. Two bullets passed, both within a foot, one on either side. Now, you understand, that's not by accident. One on either side. I flung myself against the banks of the cutting, but they gave no cover. Another glance at the figures, one was now kneeling to aim. Again, I darted forward. Movement seemed the only chance. Again, two soft kisses sucked in the air. Death stood before me, grim, sullen death, without his lighthearted companion, chance. You know, suddenly realize when you're all out of chances. So I held up my hand. Winston Churchill surrendering to the Boers. He says, then I was herded with the other prisoners in a miserable group. And about the same time, I noticed that my hand was bleeding. So, whoo, shoo, 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 and then a fifth shot, which had apparently grazed his hand. They were bracketing Winston as he, as he tried to run away and it began to pour with rain. That's his last memory of this, of this uh, uh, affair. Marched off to prison in the Boer capital of Pretoria, uh, he understands for the first time the miserable plight of the prisoner of war. Once again, from Winston's own words. <clears throat> the position of a prisoner of war is painful and humiliating. A man tries his best to kill another, and finding that he cannot succeed, asks his enemy for mercy. All military pride, all independence of spirit must be put aside. Favors must be accepted from those with whom we have a long and bitter quarrel, from those who feel fiercely that we seek to do them cruel injustice. The dog who has been whipped must be thankful for the bone that is flung to him. You know, there's a reason that the Geneva Convention outlaws the t taking of photographs of prisoners of war. So it's, it's a human being at his or her most miserable. It, it's it. I'm toast. <laughs> I will never see my family. I will never see my home. I'll never see my wife, loved ones again. That's what every prisoner of war is thinking in that moment. And undoubtedly, that's what Winston was thinking. Now, Churchill being Churchill, the, this will never do. Within a week of his captivity, he notices the patterns of the sentries who keep watch. Uh, the, the Boers kind of come and go. They're not really an army, so they don't really have ranks. And then who, who's, people just kind of shift on and off in guarding the, guarding the prisoner camps. He notices the patterns of the sentries who keep watch. One night, they're preoccupied, talking to one another. He hops over the wall, tumbles into a garden waiting below, and escapes. I mean, the rest of the book describes a nearly impossible set of scrapes, of close calls, of near captures, as Churchill hikes cross-country from Pretoria, South Africa, to the port of Lorenzo Marquez in the Portuguese colony of Mozambique. It's a trek across much of Southern Africa. He boards a steamer. And soon he is back in British South Africa at the Cape. The entire process. So count it up. Ambush, capture, captivity, escape, trek. Has taken him a little over a month. One of the great war stories of the 20th century. There's a war story I think cements Winston Churchill's legendary reputation. It's the, it's the armor train. It's the captivity in Pretoria. And then, of course, it's this, this fascinating escape. Now, this is where uh, we will stop. Not, not with Winston's entire adult career, although we'll have time for questions and we can answer any question you may have, but the formative military experiences of his youth. And they were very broad indeed. Just a recap, insurrection in Cuba, mountain warfare against the fierce tribes of Afghanistan, a great slaughter battle in Africa, brave men being chewed up by machines in the Sudan. And finally, in South Africa, the human equation gut-wrenching fear of death as a Boer rifleman coolly takes aim at him at point-blank range. The utter helplessness of being captured and marched off into captivity. A mortal man caught up in circumstances beyond his control. And yet, the determination never 
to give in, never to cry uncle and the escape. Uh, much later, in 1940, we can hear echoes of Winston's South African experience. We will never surrender, he declared, just when things looked bleakest and London stood under the shadow of the swastika. L let's go back to that early quote from Harrow, someday I'll be in a great position and I will rescue the British Empire from destruction. You know, Wordsworth was right. The child is father of the man. And in Winston Churchill's case, some child, some man. Thank you very much. Well, thank you to both Richard and Rob. Uh, we're going to have some moments for Q&A, so please raise your hand. You'll Richard, see me running up and down the stairs. Uh, Richard and Rob will be at the podium and share this microphone or the podium microphone, whichever you prefer. Uh, so please raise your hand, and we'll, we'll do about 10 minutes of Q&A. Oh, come on, gang. We'll go, to, we'll go to Lee Pollock here, all the way opposite. <laughs> Uh, this, Richard, this is a, a question for you. Um, I know that historians don't like to do what if or counterfactual histories, but in looking at the development of German history from Bismarck's time and then through to the 1930s, do you think that there was or could have been an alternative way for Germany? Um, one of the things I'm always fascinated <coughs> about is Emperor Frederick dying after three months and his son, his headstrong son succeeding him. If he had lived or if Bismarck had stayed on longer, was there an alternative, and I think it's a German expression for it, an alternative way for Germany into the 20th century that might not have led to two world wars and all the carnage? Uh, well, that's a great question. Um, we, we actually do deal in, in what ifs in a certain sense because we always have to think of you know, what happened and what could have happened. Um, certainly, there was nothing inevitable about Hitler. There was nothing inevitable about the Third Reich. Um, of course, the... Frederick III, um, I mentioned sort of this, um, uh, he was the father of Wilhelm II and was, was always seen to be this sort of liberal alternative. Um, and the idea being, had he lived instead of dying after only three months, uh, that Germany might have followed a more liberal path. I think that's also more uh, myth. Uh, there's a, a recent biography of him that came out um, that uh, cast doubt on the degree of his liberalism and whether he would have been able to do much in that regard. Um, but even without that, and Bismarck, of course, couldn't live forever anyway. He was, he was an old man when he, when he passed. Um, you know, Germany in the 1920s was a democracy, um, and there were uh, many people who supported that democracy. Uh, but there was also a very strong component in the German polity that was very much invested in this kind of irrational politics that I was describing from before the First World War uh, that only intensified in those crisis years. And they saw that democracy as being fundamentally un-German, as being fundamentally foreign, uh, and that had to be destroyed. Uh, and they used that Bismarck image in part to, to help that along. Um, but they got help in that from things that were beyond their control, the economic crises that occurred, um, the second one at the end of the 1920s, and decisions that were made by the people who put Hitler in power. Again, he was not elected chancellor. Uh, he was placed in power uh, not because the people who appointed him or, or maneuvered him in thought he was the next Bismarck, um, but that they could use him um, and... Um, those were decisions, again, that were not necessary. But again, they were very much um, inspired by those ideas of leadership, uh, that they were the natural leaders. So, um, yeah, when I talk about Bismarck to Hitler, it's not a natural and it's not an automatic progression from one to the other. It's, in many respects, a created one, right? It's an imagined one that takes place over these decades. And circumstances also allow that then to, to become real. the front row here. Was there any element of anti-Semitism in, in Bismarck's character or indeed his political movement? Uh, well, that's a great question. Uh, the, the, the issue of anti-Semitism, obviously if you're thinking about Bismarck and Hitler, 
where is, you think there should be some. Uh, I mean, Bismarck was an anti-Semite in the sense that every one of his social class pretty much was. Um, not really a racial anti-Semite. Um, they saw Jews as, uh, you know, social climbers, as nouveau riche, um, as, of course, not Christian, um, but not um, in the kind of conspiratorial and, again, sort of biological threat that develops over time. And you know, just like with, with any kind of creation of a myth, uh, again, Bismarck was alive long enough and he had a long enough career that, of course, he said things about Jews that you, know, you could use and say, yeah, Bismarck, of course, didn't like Jews either. Um, but Hitler, in fact, um, aside from all the things that he did borrow from Bismarck, or at least you know, shape into his own, um, he said, essentially, that, that Bismarck, as he put it, really knew nothing about the Jewish question. You know, that's, for me to, that's for me to take care of. But certainly, the Bismarckians in the cult, for the most part, increasingly were, were of that kind of radical anti-Semitic uh, persuasion. So it, it got sort of added on to it, but not so much because of what he ever did himself. I don't mind taking the stairs, so if anybody in the back has questions, please. Give Jeremy some exercise. I could, I could use it, actually. We'll go to your right, gentlemen. Second row up the stairs, please. What about a more personal question about... Oh. What about a personal question about uh, Churchill's life? Um, I read a few years ago about a pet that he owned named Charlie. Do you know anything about that? That is an easy one. Is, am I on? No. <laughs> I, I could do 30 seconds and they'll still come out. No. <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I'm sorry. But I bet people in the room do. Anyone know about Charlie the pet? What kind of pet? Well, one of the, uh, one of the aspects, sir, is that Dr. Huxon will get into his life at Chartwell. Uh, but I think between Lee Pollock, Ted Martin, Herschel Abbott, many of our Churchillians in the audience, when we get to a break, uh, I can point them out to you. But I know that Keith is going to talk a little bit about his, his uh, animal friends a little bit at the uh, chart well. Uh, next question up to the right, about halfway up. I don't actually have a question. <laughs> I have students that are enamored of Churchill and I've ordered all sorts of books, and they've covered all of them, except for the one I've not yet unboxed from Amazon, and it is about Charlie. So <laughs> I'll read that book and, and give all the, uh, the more fun, petty anecdotes that you want. I'll give you our, our private school's phone number. Forging to the very cutting edge of Churchill Scholarship right now. I'm glad. <laughs> book just about to be released. That's fantastic. We'll be back next week for yeah, right. another program, and she can present. Oh, uh, Jeremy, I, I thought you had the question. Excuse me. All the way in the back to the right, please, gentlemen. Don't you think young Winston looks like uh, Joe Burrow? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I graduated from the Ohio State University. We gave you Joe Burrow. I just want to state that for the record. <laughs> All the way in the back to the center, please. As we all know, uh, Hitler was a total racist. Do you all believe that uh, the racism of Hitler affected the dynamics of the war to the extent that Germany may not have done a more brutal attack on England, even at Dunkirk, because, of course, the Germans are Anglo-Saxons. They were Teutonic people. Hitler was of Teutonic descent somewhat. Do you think that affected the dynamics and tempo of the war? Uh, Richard, you can start with that. I'll, I'll chip in it when you're done. Okay. Um, race, race was at the heart of Hitler's uh, ideology, of his, of his worldview in, it, in its entirety, and it certainly shaped um, the entire purpose of the war, really, um, from all of the choices he made in terms of who he was going to attack when and, and, and where. Um, <clears throat> There, there certainly was a difference in treatment of uh, soldiers on the Western Front than there was in the East. Um, the, the biggest example of that of, is the, uh, the mortality rate of Soviet POWs, uh, Soviets captured by the Germans um, of uh, 
over 5 million uh, Soviet POWs, uh, Soviet soldiers captured, over 3 million died in captivity. It was a 57% mortality rate. Um, the percentage, the mortality rate of British and American soldiers captured by the Germans was about 3%. So, yes, there was a racial hierarchy in that sense, and, and they were treated. If, I don't think it would have, it, it would have affected the, the nature of the fight, right, in that they had to be defeated, and uh, I think that was more a function of, of uh, from my understanding, yeah, I'm not a military historian, uh, but Goering's uh, influence in getting Hitler to allow the Air Force to try to uh, destroy that force rather than sending in the army. Um, but had they gotten there, you know, they would have captured them. They would not have necessarily massacred them the way that they did with, with Soviet soldiers. Yeah, I'll, I'll just I'll toss in one thing. I, I, I studied the Wehrmacht for a living in World War II. It's one, uh, so I read the sources as much as I can. This notion that, the, that Hitler wanted to spare common Anglo-Saxon blood, it's plausible based on Hitler's own racial ideology. There's no doubt about it. But what there is not is a document where he actually says so. So there's a lot of reasons that the, the German army doesn't roll onto the beaches of Dunkirk or prosecute, or the German military prosecute the war more effectively against Britain. There's a lot of reasons. And, and this is a plausible one. I, I, I think it is. It's just there's no real documentary evidence for it. So historians always have to treat that with a little bit of caution. <laughs>